I want to think with you today on the subject of Jesus, what's required then and what's required today. Why did Jesus come in the first place? And it's because we couldn't do it. He came because we cannot do it. And uh, all of the televangelists and all the different uh, things that are being put out yonder are just shams that to, are out to get your money. That's all they have to do. Recently, while I was driving, I heard this up. Uh, I heard this radio program where a radio therapist uh, was talking on there, a psychotherapist, and she was talking to people that would call in, and one of them called in, and she had a question. She was getting married, and and, uh, her fiancé and her had a difference of opinion about uh, Jesus. And she wanted to ask the psychotherapist what she should do. This is where people go today to get their advice to books and and mystics and... uh, and radio programs and all of that, rather than coming to church and getting it from the Word of God. And so she called in and asked her, she said, Now, the fiancé that I'm fixing to marry, he's, he's great, he's a loving guy, he treats me wonderful, he does great things for me, I feel good when I'm around him. There's only one problem that, I, that I've detected, and I wanted to ask you about that, if it was a problem or not. And she said, What is the problem? He said, Well, she said, Well, he does not believe that Jesus actually raised from the dead. She believed that when he died, he stayed dead, and that that's just something that's been made up for Christians to believe in. And said, but I don't believe that way. I believe that Jesus actually did resurrect on the third day, and that he's alive and in heaven today. The radio therapist thought for a few minutes and says, "Well, I have two questions that I'd like to ask you. I'd like to focus in two areas to determine." whether this is a good marriage potential for you or not. And she said, the first question that I'd like to ask is that really a statement I sense the way you're explaining this to me, that he's not going to change his mind. In fact, you mentioned that he's a leader in that religion that he's in. And I don't sense that he's going to change his mind. He's going to hold on to that belief and try to get you to believe that way. And then she said, the second thing is more or less a question. She says, I'd like to ask you, if marrying a man like that, does it pose any problems for you? And because I sense from what you're saying that you do believe that Jesus raised from the dead and that He's alive today. She said, yes, I do. And she said, well, let me ask you this. Do you see any problem in marrying a man like that that's a leader in a religion that does not believe Jesus raised from the dead? Do you see any problem in your everyday life being married to a man like that? woman thought for a few minutes, and she thought real hard, and she said, No, I really can't see how it would affect my everyday life at all. And I want you to understand something, my dear friend. That is the case in so many people that call themselves Christians today, is they really cannot see the difference in a non-believer, a person that does not believe that Jesus is God, that He raised from the dead. That is the whole theme of the New Testament. If you take and throw that thought out, you literally have to throw away the last 26 books of the Bible. You have to throw away the New Testament because that is the focus of the New Testament, is that Jesus raised from the dead. We see a lot of religions that focus on the cross, my dear friends, but that's not what the New Testament is about. The New Testament is a focus upon the resurrection of Jesus and that He is alive and that the cross is empty. There is no dead Jesus on the cross in Christianity of the New Testament, there is only an empty cross and Jesus is alive. He's not alive, uh, on a, He's not dead on a cross somewhere. Well, I want to think with you tonight about the major teaching in the New Testament and it's found in the book of Colossians tonight as we move into a new book tonight. We finish Philippians and move over to this one to take a look at this and to get the gist of what's going on. Philippian church was an interesting church. It was uh, located uh, uh, near two other cities. One of the names of the cities was Laodicea, and the other was Oropolis. And as we stop and think about this city, it was real close to them. It's kind of like Hollywood Park and, and Lackland Air Force Base. They're real close to the city of San Antonio. And so the the thinking that goes on in one of those areas uh, would affect the thinking that goes on in the other areas because they were all within just eye vision of each other. 
First thing I notice as I look at this passage tonight is there is an invasion going on. Three eyes that I'd like to look at with you tonight. There is an invasion going on of Gnosticism today. Gnosticism is invading Christianity. It was invading Christianity in that day. And it's still going on today. And Jesus required something from us. He requires that we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, as you see people baptized, that's one of the questions that I ask them is their belief in Jesus Christ. Do you believe He's alive? Do you believe He's the reason that that you're saved? Do you believe that He's the one that will get you into heaven? A dead Jesus can't do anything for you. He's just another uh, religious symbol like uh, any of the others, like Joseph Smith or or like... uh, uh, any, any one of the different false religions, uh, idols and, and statues and all these different things, they're dead as doornails and they can do you no good. But Jesus, the head of the Christian church, is alive today and He can do something. But the church is being invaded by Gnosticism. It was in Colossians' day when Paul wrote the letter to them and it is so today too. We see it so much today. As I look at this passage with you, go in your Bibles with me to Colossians, the first chapter, and let's look at the first verse together. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by God's will, and Timothy, our brother. Remember, he always tells who's writing and to whom he's writing. Paul is writing, and he's writing to um, Timothy, uh, uh, to the Colossian church, and to Timothy, our brother to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now the first thing we ought to notice as we look at this passage is that the Colossae church believed that Jesus was alive. They believed in Jesus being alive. They believed as Paul does. Well, Paul would not have said this. And then he goes on to say, We give thanks always to God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love that you have for all the saints. Because of the hope reserved for you in heaven, you have already heard about this hope in words of truth. And the gospel, that's the good news that Jesus is alive. The gospel, the gospel is there for you. He has come to you. He's bearing fruit and in you. People are joining the church. We're seeing people saved from you. It is bearing fruit. It's growing all over the world just as it has among you since the day you heard about it and came to truly appreciate God's faith. And then His grace. You learn this from Epiditus, our dearly loved loved fellow servant. Now, Epiditus was down there heading up the church in Colossae. Paul never went to the city of Colossae. He never went to this city. He never went to any of the three cities that are nearby there. He's a faithful minister of Christ. This is Ephroditus. And he is a member uh, on your behalf. In other words, he was the pastor. He was there for the purpose of the people there. And he has told us about your love in the Spirit. And then he goes on in verse 9 to say, For this reason also, since the days we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. And we are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk in worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, and being strengthened with all power. As we see this, we see it goes on to say, according to the glorious might that you have a great endurance, patience, joyfully given thanks to the Father who has enabled you to be this way and to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom the Son loves. And in Him we have redemption, that is the forgiveness of sins. As we look at this passage, we see that He writes to this church as they are a loving, caring church, a believing church in Jesus Christ being alive, and that They are putting their faith and trust in Him. But something's going on is the reason He's writing this letter to them. And we're going to see that unveiled. And what it is, is it's Gnosticism. 
Colossae was near two cities, as I mentioned. One of them was Laodicea. One of them was Oropolis. The words mean lukewarm. Have you ever had coffee that was lukewarm? Is it good? No. You'd rather it be hot, and some of you'd rather it be cold. Hot or cold, but no lukewarm coffee. How about lukewarm anything? We don't want lukewarm. We want it hot or we want it cold. Jewish, but Gnosticism is known for introducing several things into Christian faith. Into a church like ours, Gnosticism come and raises its ugly head and tries to bring it in. As we look at this tonight, go to the Lord in prayer with me and ask that God will show you the truth about His Word and what's going on so that you won't be fooled and misled as the Colossi church was being threatened to be misled by the lukewarmness of these two cities that was nearby. Heavenly Father, help us to see what Gnosticism is, where it's a, a belief in knowledge instead of a belief in the, the clear fact that Jesus is alive and that our faith and trust is in Him and Him alone. Speak to us, Lord, and help us to understand not only that Jesus is alive, but that He is leading the church today. And that all these other things that want to be attached to church today are not relevant. They're things that are not to be a, uh, a part of our faith. Speak to our hearts tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The word Gnosticism, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M. Gnosticism is an important word. Look at Revelations with me. Revelation 3, verse 14. Write to the angel of the church at Laodicea. That was one of the two names. Thus saith the Amen. That's Jesus Christ. Amen. The faithful and the true witness, the originator of God's creation. Jesus is the originator of God's creation. Everything that we have today, you and me, the world, the stars, all of that was created by Jesus Christ. He says, I know your works that you're neither cold nor hot, as he thinks about Laodicea. I wish that you were cold or hot. He goes on to say, so because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's God speaking. For you say I'm rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing, and you don't even realize that you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. That's how God sees those that add to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not how much you know, it's who in whom you place your total trust in Jesus Christ. That's the reason in baptism, the question I asked them, if you stood before God in heaven and He said, why should I let you into heaven? Who would it be that gets you into heaven? And if they don't answer Jesus, I don't baptize them. Now, in the life of this church, there's actually been a person that went through all the process, came into the board of baptistry, and you think, he just asks those questions. They're just routine questions. doesn't matter what they say. And when the lady told me and the wrong answer, and I repeated the question to make sure she didn't, she says, I don't know. Uh, I helped her as she walked out of the baptistry, and I did not baptize her. And she could not understand why I wouldn't baptize her. Baptism is something that you do after after you know that Jesus is alive and that He alone is the one that's going to get you into heaven. If any other thing stands in your way of believing that, it is Gnosticism. If you, you think, well, I just have to clean up my life. You think, well, I need to join the church. You think, well, I need to do this and I need to do that. Jesus put it this way. If you believe and are baptized, then you're saved. Now, sometimes people take Mark 16, 16 in the wrong way, and they think, well, that means baptism is necessary for salvation. My dear friend, you can be baptized, get wet 215,000 times, and you'll still be lost and go into hell unless you first believe that Jesus is alive and that He is God and that He and He alone is the one that can get you into heaven. Gnosticism is a lukewarmness. It's a strange blending of a Christian truth. Now, there's Christian truth, 
And then they take Jewish legalism and begin to add the law and you've got to keep the rules and you've got to do this and you've got to count the beads and you've got to pray to the idols. And Eastern mysticism, which is allegedly there to give believers a secret knowledge not possessed by other people. Gnosticism is a terrible disease that is affecting the Christian church today by whatever name, religion it is. Gnosticism is out there trying to destroy the faith and trust in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. Gnosticism greatly affected this congregation at Colossae because they were coming from the other two cities, just as this church is made up of people that come from all kind of communities across the San Antonio metropolitan area. Their church had people coming from the different three cities too. And the result was they were bringing Gnosticism into the church and it was affecting people's beliefs. You're familiar with the poster footprints. I like the poster. I see some value in the poster, but the poster actually came from Gnosticism. You remember the poster? I gave you a picture of it there. And it's where the person's walking along the beach and the footprints are there. And they come to a place in their life when things are just falling down around them and they feel like, where is God? And they look back and they look and sure enough, there's only one set of footprints there. Well, Gnosticism believes there was always one set of footprints. And guess whose footprints they are? They're your footprints. God never had a body. God never lived in Gnosticism. God is just a story that people told. Jesus was never alive. He was just a story that people told. You can't believe in Jesus. He's just a theory. He's just a a way of believing in God, if you please. But Jesus never lived a physical life and then went to the cross and suffered and paid for your sins. Jesus is just a myth that the church uses today that it's you keeping the rules, paying the right things, doing the right places, going to the right places, and all of these different things. And they see the fact in Gnosticism that it's what you know that will get you into heaven. It's that special knowledge that you can have. If you join their church, then you can have that special knowledge that will get you into heaven. Um, There's a scientific religion out there that teaches that. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists uh, get into Gnosticism too. All, All false religions have a form of Jesus Christ, but the truth of the matter is they do not see Him as God who created the world and came down to earth, lived a life without sin, and then was crucified on a cross. As a man, he was dead. For three days, he was in the ground. And then after three days, he got up on his own and came back, and he lived for 40 days and 40 nights on the earth in front of people, with people, eating and talking and and sharing with people to prove that he has the power over life and death. That's something you can put your teeth into. That's a real stake. That's something that you can trust in. And that's the reason that, that the first thing you have to do in Mark 16, 16, is you have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that He lived and died for your sins, and then be baptized. That proves you're saved. Not being baptized, not being believing only, but by belief and baptism. Baptism is a way of picturing it and giving a public testimony of the fact that you believe it. Do you know that every person that gets baptized in this church, the video of them getting baptized is on our webpage? And that's a way that they can look back. I don't remember my baptism uh, date that well unless I go back to my Bible. And actually, I don't have my Bible. I have my mother's Bible, and in it recorded the day she got baptized because I got baptized on the same day. Many of you know my testimony. I got saved six months before she did, but she wouldn't let me get baptized because she didn't believe in it. She didn't think I was good enough to be baptized. Then she got saved as a result of me being saved, and then she said, let's get baptized, and we went and got baptized together. Baptism doesn't save you. Believing in Jesus Christ saves you, and then comes baptism. I don't care if you've had 255 baptisms before you give your life to Jesus and come to the solid knowledge that Jesus died for you and He's alive and well and that He's the one that will take you into heaven. You need to be baptized after you believe that because that's what Jesus said 
and that settles it. Well, the footprints poster shows that picture of walking and God carrying you. But I want you to know something. It's a lie. Jesus didn't start carrying you when you got into trouble. When you give your life to Jesus, He picks you up then. And the only footprints in the sand the whole way in that journey are the footprints of Jesus, not you. Because Jesus is alive and He does have a body and He does leave footprints in the sand regardless of what the Gnostics thought when they put that poster out to prove that God did not have a body ever and that He could not carry you, that He left you here to take care of yourself. It's not what God does for you, it's what you do. You do everything you can, here's the Gnostics believe, you do everything you can and then what you can't, God will do it for you. That's Gnosticism. How many of you ever believed that way? That's Gnosticism. And that's the discount what Jesus did for you. The Christian says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Period. It's not I do all I can and then God will do the rest. That's Gnosticism. That's false. That's putting down Jesus Christ. It's I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me from the Scriptures. Invading our churches today is Gnosticism and it's deadly, my friend. Second, there is an invisible image of God. An image of God that's invisible. His name is Jesus Christ. He's as real as you are real. Jesus is alive and well, and He's in heaven, and He's waiting for the day when your number gets punched, and He reaches down and takes you by the hand and introduces you to the Heavenly Father. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. No one's ever seen the Father, but many have seen Jesus Christ, who is the exact image of the invisible God the Father. As we look at Scripture found in Colossians verse 15, follow along with me. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn. He's the first one to go to heaven after dying as a human being. He's the first one. Now, He was alive and in heaven before, but He became a man, incarnate is that word, and He lived on earth, walked with men, He's the first man to go to heaven after he died here on earth. And he is the first one, the Scripture says in verse 15. It says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, every human. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. He is the only authority. Verse 18, as we close, it says, He is also the head of the church. He's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the church. He is the firstborn from the dead. There would be you and others that believe in Jesus Christ and have followed Him in believers' baptism. You'll also go to heaven. But He was the firstborn the first human to go to heaven. And you can go there too if you believe and trust in Him to get you in. And then in verse 18, so that He might come to have the very first place in everything. Jesus does not want a place in your life. Jesus wants to be preeminent. He wants to be all in your life. It's an interesting thing as we look. Jesus is required then, and Jesus is required now, his resurrection gives him title to the throne of preeminence of the, of the center place in heaven because he is the firstborn, the very first human from the dead that rose and is alive in heaven today. And belief and trust in him to get you into heaven means that he will take you by the hand and lead you on the path that he took straight into heaven itself. I hope that's your belief. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. But if our gospel is veiled, if there's anything about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, if there's anything that's veiled that's kind of unclear, it is only veiled to those that are what? Perishing. You say, well, I just don't understand all that about Jesus. It means you're lost. It means you're perishing. It means if you died tonight, you would not go to heaven. You ought to understand that Jesus is the firstborn. He's the first human to die and three days later to resurrect from the dead. 
and 40 days later to ascend into heaven, and He offers you that gift if you place your faith and trust in Him and in Him alone. Not in religion, but in Him and Him alone. You have to first believe that in your heart of hearts, and then you have to publicly profess it. That's what believer's baptism is. If you haven't done both, then you're not saved. You might say, well, that's your belief. I'm sorry, it's not my belief. It's God's belief. He's the one that said it, not I. And then look further with me at John 1, 18. John 1, 18. No one has ever seen God. The one and only Son who Himself is God is at the Father's side and He has revealed God. If I told you there's a great restaurant in town I'd like to introduce you, you could guess all night long, but you wouldn't know what it was until I did what? Told you. Took you there. And Jesus says, and paid for the meal. <laughs> That's what Jesus did for you. He not only told you, He not only showed you by living His life and ascending into heaven Himself, but He's even paid the meal. All sins are forgiven by belief and trust in Him and Him alone and by public profession of faith in Jesus Christ in baptism. The church is His body today. Some people say, well, I, I don't believe you have to go to church to be a Christian. Hurry, you just go right, you just might as well throw away the last 26 books of the Bible. By the way, the, the others too say the same thing, all 66 of them do. You have to go to church. Church is where the body of Jesus Christ gathers. It'd be like saying, I'm going to have supper at night, but my body's not going to be there. How you do that? Is that called a spiritual meal where you think about it? Don't you like your body to show up with a, the dining room table set with food and you sit down and push it in? Isn't that neat? Yeah. To not be part of the church, to not be a member of the church, to not be a participating member of the church is like eating without having food. It, it's, it, it's not even rational to think that way. The church is His body and He is the head of the church. Pastor's not the head of the church. You're not the head of the church. Oh, we vote, and I'm, I'm set up as the leader of the church, but I'm not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. And what He says is what goes. The church is a new creation. It's, it's something that Jesus started. He began it with His first 12 disciples. His resurrection gave Him the title as the head of the church and the throne of preeminence. He's in charge. He's everything. He's preeminent. And He is the firstborn the firstborn from the dead. If you want to get to heaven and be born into heaven, then my dear friend, you've got to get there through Jesus. That's the only way in. He is the firstborn, meaning that there are many others that have come along since Jesus in heaven itself. Once you get in, you don't lose it. That's the neat thing about it. He's the firstborn. That is, He was first to rise from the dead, never to die again. Did you hear that? You can be the second to die and raise from the dead in the new life. Isn't that neat? Isn't that something? At my funeral, it's already planned and already paid for the policy and all that and already got in there the instructions how I want it done. When I die, there won't be a body brought to this church. State law, federal law actually, requires that my body be kept cool until time for it to be put in the grave. I think that has to do with the fact the funeral home don't want a stinking body in the, in, the, in the house there. And so when I die, they'll come pick my body up, they'll take it to the mortuary, and they'll put it in a cooler there. You've seen them. They open the door and push you inside. When it comes time to take you to the grave, they open the door and pull you out and take you there. Nothing, nothing, nothing's to be done to my body after I die. No face paint's going to be put on. No embalming fluid's going to be put on. You know why? Because I'm not there. And I don't want a penny of any money that's left when I die being wasted on my body. I don't want it embalmed. I don't want it incinerated. I just want them to take the body, take it out to the grave, and drop it in. You know why? Because that's what the law requires. That's the way they did with Jesus, too. And I want to follow the pattern that Jesus used for His life. 
Why? Because look what happened. If the, what if they'd taken the body and incinerated it on the day that Jesus died? What if they'd thrown it down in Gehenna? That's what was common in that day. They incinerated the bodies of poor people that day. They threw them down. They burned them into ashes. That's what they. That's the way they did it. That was the pagans' belief. Just throw them out there and burn them up. They don't need it anymore. What if they'd incinerated his body? Now, there's no question about the fact that Jesus could have raised from the ashes, but wasn't it a lot simpler that they took and stuck his body in the grave because he was going to need that body in three days? And when I die, my body is, a, my body is going to be thrown away here until the day Jesus comes back and raises the bodies from the dead. Till then, it can just decay in the ground somewhere. But on the, my instructions, the thing is take the body, put it in the ground, Covered up, that's all that's necessary. I want a memorial service here at the church for people to be reminded of the fact that I'm in heaven, enjoying life, kicking up my heels, and if you're weeping over me, you're wasting a lot of tears you don't need to because I'm not here and don't want to come back here. I am enjoying heaven to the max, okay? That's what I want when I die, and that's the instructions I put in my funeral, that, uh, that no money be it spent on a funeral except what state law requires and that uh, we have to go along with. The church is His body. We're to protect the church. We're to nourish the church. We're to take care of the church until the time that the church dies. And then, when this church dies, guess what's going to turn into? I won't be here, but guess what will happen to it? It'll probably be turned into a bar. That seems to be the common thing where churches that die fold up. That seems to be the common thing. Bars pay more money for church buildings than anybody else does. That's probably what will happen to this building right here when you and I stop putting our money and our attention and caring for the body of Jesus Christ because that's what this is. When we stop caring for the body of Jesus Christ, it will die and the body will go somewhere else. But the church, along with the body of Christ, will just be turned into a grocery store or a convenience store, pour down or whatever, because it will serve no purpose anymore. My dear friend, that's what happens to the invisible of the image of God. He's alive in heaven, and so will you be alive in heaven. The church is His body, and we're just the firstborn. He's the firstborn, and we come after Him. And then, as I close, not only is it in, is Gnosticism invading this, this stuff that is polluting the Christian belief out of the New Testament, but it's also the image of the invisible God. The church is the image. When people look at this church, I want you to understand something. They see God. I've told you this before, and you see it, whether you realize it or not, when you see somebody come into this church for the first time, you can be sure of one single thing. Who knows what it is? They're in trouble. They're hurting. They're grieving. Marriage is falling apart. They're broke. They lost their home. And they're looking for God. And where do they go to find God? Come to the body of Jesus Christ, the church. And when they come into this building, if you don't love on them and hug on them and take care of them... What would you do if you knew that they just lost their spouse? What would you do if you, they found, you found out that yesterday their child got run over by a car? What would you do to them if you knew this? Why, you'd love on them and care about them. And my dear friend, that's the only reason that people come and visit a church. Sometimes they say, well, we moved into the neighborhood. You don't know the backstory. I often find the backstory when I talk to them later. But it's how we treat them as a body of Christ here as to whether they ever want to come back or not. And it's determined in the first five minutes of them walking through that door, first five minutes, whether they'll ever come back here or not. They may sit the entire service. They may even go out to eat at my invitation. But one thing is they will not come back here unless they feel the love and caring about them personally. Now, if they come here for a month and then drop out, there's another reason. And we don't need to get into that right now, but the bottom line is they just didn't find the aliveness of Jesus' body here and they're looking for a church that's alive. They have to see the work of people in here doing more than just shaking hands. They have to 
see them alive and serving God and believing that Jesus is, is able to change people's lives. They have to see when new people come in that they're loved on and cared for or else they'll leave because they're looking for a church that's the body of Christ and alive. You see, the church is the in, image of the invisible God. And last, it's the invisible bridge between God and man. It's the invisible bridge between God and man. They see this is the way to get there. You see, people are sinful, but God is holy. And the way we get from sinful to holy is through Jesus Christ. He is the invisible bridge to God. And that's what people are looking for, is this church a place that they can find the true God. Do they find in here a genuine trust and faith in Jesus Christ that He is alive and that He's affecting and changing our lives? I hope they see that in you. Look at uh, Colossians verse 19. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Jesus Christ in Him, and through Him to reconcile everything. God wants to reconcile every one of us to Himself, but only through Jesus Christ. Whether things on the earth or things in the heavens, by making peace through His blood that shed blood on the cross. That's how He does it. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds and you expressed in your, expressed in your evil desires. But when you came to Jesus, now He has reconciled you. He's brought you to God through, by His physical body, through His life, and through His death, and to present you as a holy, blameless person before Jesus Christ. Jesus takes His death on the cross, holy and blameless, and He took your sins and took them to the grave so that He can take you and wrap you in His arms and take you before the Heavenly Father as holy and blameless. If you indeed remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, this good news, this gospel that has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and uh, and I, Paul, have become a servant in You become a servant. You want to serve Christ once you do that. Now rejoice in my sufferings. He says, I'm living it up here in jail getting beatings. This is great. I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am complete in my flesh. What is lacking in Christ's affliction is for the church to come to life, the church to come to life, the body of Christ. I have become its servant according to God's commission, and I was given to me for you to make the Word of God fully known to you. That's the purpose of a pastor. That was the purpose of Pastor Paul as he wrote to the church, to teach people the Word of God from the Bible. The mysteries hidden from the ages. People don't hear it. They only will find it out in a church nine-tenths of the time, if not nine and nine-tenths of the time, only in a church. The mysteries hidden for the ages and generations will now be revealed to His saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we proclaimed Him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may be present, everyone mature, growing up, smart, understanding the Word of God. And I labor for this. Paul says, I labor for you to know the Word of God, striving with His strength of world powerful, the works of God powerful in me. Then he closes as he realizes that he has shared with us the whole purpose of the church. Acts 4.12 kind of sums it up. Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven and earth given to people by which we must be saved. And then, summing it up even further, look at John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say the Baptist, the the Presbyterian, the Methodist, the Catholic, the the Latter-day Saints. He didn't say that. He said, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Find a church that believes that. Put yourself there. Become a member, a supporting member of it, and get busy. Every time somebody new comes in the church, love on them to the point that they become so secure that they're beginning to love on new people coming in themselves. Anything other than a pure faith in Jesus Christ always has the same effect. It leads you where? 
it'll lead you to hell. Faith in a religion will lead you to hell. Faith in a preacher will lead you to hell. Faith in Jesus is forever and it'll lead you to heaven. Father, I thank you tonight for your word. How powerful your word is. No matter which chapter we look in, we see different circumstances, but they all point back to the same thing. And that is that the church is the body of Christ. And it begins by a person believing Jesus is alive and well and that He died on the cross, He resurrected, and that He's only the firstborn. All the rest that believe in Him will also be in heaven with Him too. The moment they die, but Lord, belief and, and not voicing it to somebody else. Jesus said it this way, if, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before the Heavenly Father. We not only have to believe it, and Lord, we have to put it into practice by believer's baptism, which tells other people publicly, I put my faith and trust in Jesus. He alone is going to get me in heaven. And then to begin to live like it so that you can be a witness to other people. Thank you, Jesus. Speak our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You stand with me, please. And as we sing, you come as God leads you. I'll be here to help you.